So, as the final lecture on difficult problems, we will look at these two classes of problems called P and NP. So, last time we said that when a problem is intractable, it may admit something which we call a checking algorithm. So, a checking algorithm would at least allow us to validate that the solution is correct. We may not be able to generate the solution efficiently, but if we take an input x instance and a claimed solution s for it, then we can validate whether that solution s is truly a solution or not. So, if this happens, then we say that something has a checking algorithm. So, the class NP is the class of problems for which this check can be done efficiently. Right? So, I have a checking algorithm which verifies a solution in polynomial time in the size of the instance. That means that the solution that I am presented must also be small because otherwise I will not be able to validate it. So, if I give you an in input i, the solution that I need to check must be polynomial in i. It cannot be a gigantic thing. For instance, it cannot be that to validate that something is the shortest path, you give me all the paths and say you please check that this is minimum amongst these because that would not be feasible in polynomial time because the certificate itself is too large. So, all the problems that we have been looking at which seem to be intractable, factorization, factorization remember I asked you to find two prime numbers which multiply to n, you give me p and q, these are small compared to the input n because they are factors of n, they will be smaller than n. I have to multiply which is efficient and I can find out. Satisfiability, you give me an assignment of the n variables, I just have to plug in and check. Travelling salesman, vertex cover, independent set, if you give me the checking version with a budget or with a bound on the k, I can check. So, all of these problems are in NP. And as we said, when we take these optimization problems like finding the shortest traveling salesman tour or finding the maximum independent set or the minimum vertex cover and we converted it to the budget version which is a checkable problem, we can actually think of it as doing a logarithmic number of checks. right? So, it is still checkable even in the optimization version if we just add a log step. So, and that is ok for us. So, why is this class called NP? Well, it has a historical reason. So, NP comes from non-deterministic polynomial time. right? So, this is a mouthful. So, non-deterministic polynomial time. So, we have been saying earlier that polynomial time for us means efficient. So, non-deterministic polynomial time is something which is beyond the scope of this course, but essentially it, uh, this non-determinism amounts to saying that the solution that I want to check, right? either I can assume that somebody produces it or I randomly guess it. Right? So, non-determinism non corresponds to some kind of educated guess. So, you can imagine that by magic you guess a correct solution and then you can validate your correct guess in polynomial time. So, from a formal background, mathematical background, this comes from an area of called computability theory and these non-deterministic solutions come from a thing called a non-deterministic Turing machine. So, if you want to go back and read about this, you can find it in a book, but for us, the class NP is going to be defined in the simple way where there is an efficient way to validate a certificate for the problem. So, it is just in terms of existence of checking algorithms. So, P on the other hand is something that we have been dealing with. So, P is a class of problems for which we have so called efficient solutions, namely those for which we have a deterministic, we have a guaranteed solution that works in polynomial time of the input. Right, in terms of worst case complexity. So, of course, if I can solve the problem from start to finish, if I can generate the sol solution in polynomial time, it is as good as saying I can check it in polynomial time because if you give me a solution which you claim is correct, in order to check it, I will solve the problem which I can do in polynomial time and check if my solution is equal to your solution. So, I do not even have to check your solution. I have to see whether I can generate the same solution or not. Right? So, P is clearly included in NP. So, if you want to think of it in sets, the problems which can be solved in NP right, include the problems that can be called solved in P. Right? So, every problem in P is also in NP. The question is, are there things which are not in P, but which are in NP? Right? So, this is the question which asks whether the set P is actually equal to the set NP. Does every algorithm which has an efficient checking solution also have an efficient generation? Right? And intuitively, like we saw from the teacher example, it should not be the case. right? It is intuitively harder to factorize a large number into two primes than it is to multiply those two numbers to validate whether it actually gives you the original number. So, we believe that checking is easier than generation 
and this is the question of P versus NP because NP is something for which we do not know how to generate but we can check, P is something for which we can both generate and check. So, the general belief is that P is not equal to NP because intuitively one reason that this is the case and is there a more formal reason? Well, one more formal reason is that all these problems which we have been talking about right, actually are in NP and they are not known to be in P, so factorization, satisfiability, traveling salesman, all these things. Right? Moreover, they are all and this is very surprising, we saw that vertex cover and independent set which are very similar stated problems can be reduced to each other. So, they are interreducible. So, if one is hard, the other is hard, but it turns out that all of these problems are actually interreducible. So, let us look at some examples of this and the fact that they are all interreducible, we remember said if one is hard, other is hard, alternatively one is easy, all are easy because we can transfer the solutions from one to another. So, let us look at Boolean satisfiability, right. Remember Boolean satisfiability, we had x1, x2, x3 and then we said that a clause will consist of a disjunction of these literals. A literal is either an x or a not x and a formula will have a conjunction of clauses. Now, if we constrain the size of these clauses, so we say that each clause can have at most three literals, then we get something called 3 sat, right. Sat for satisfiability and 3 for 3 for the number 3. So, each clause at most three literals. So, it turns out that 3 sat is itself as hard as satisfiability. So, we can reduce 3 sat to sat or rather sat to 3 sat. Remember the reduction says if I can reduce A to B, if A is hard, B is hard, if B is easy, A is easy. So, we reduce sat to 3 sat. How do we do this? Well, we do it by example. So, supposing we have a literal uh, clause which has 5 literals. What I want to do is make sure it has at most 3 literals, but in such a way that satisfiability is not affected. So, what I will do is I will break this up into smaller clauses and combine them so the solution does not change, right. So, I can say add a literal A and split it here, right. So, remember this is an OR. So, it says one of these things must be true. So, what I am saying is either the left hand side is true or the right hand side is true. So, I am adding a new literal A. So, if A is true, then I can ignore these two, but this, since not A is true, one of these three must be true, right. So, if A is true, then the right hand side of my original clause must produce the witness. If A is false, then if A is false, then all of these are irrelevant, but because A is false, one of these must be true. So, therefore, my original clause said that one of those five must be true and the same is true after splitting it with A, either the left or the right must be true. I mean to make both the left, so I have an and here, right. So, make the both the left and the right true, I need only one of them to be true because by then setting A appropriately, I can make both sides true. So, I can keep doing the splitting. So, I can take A and split it here as we said. Now, we have, uh, we had this clause which has four things. So, I can again take this and split it here with a B and now I get 3, 3, 3. So, by repeatedly introducing these extra variables, I can split the original thing down to clauses which are size 3 and the point is that the new formula is satisfiable exactly when the old formula is satisfiable. So, it is a reduction in that sense that every for every solution to SAT translates to a solution for this and every solution to 3 SAT translates back to a solution to SAT. So, if both are either both are hard or both are easy. Now, I want to look at this other problem which is very different independent set and I want to claim that 3 SAT and independent set are in some sense related. So, 3 SAT can be reduced to independent set. If I can solve independent set, I can solve 3 set. So, I have let again a concrete thing. So, I have a formula of 3 set. So, I have 3 literals per clause at most. So, some of them have less than 3. So, I have 2, right. So, for each of these, I create this triangle, right. I create a graph which contains one node per literal and I connect it in a triangle. So, I have these 4 clauses. So, I have these 4 triangles, right. So, now, in addition to that, I connect these edges between a literal and its negation if it appears anywhere, right. So, y is connected to this not y, it is also connected to that not y. So, there is a y here, it is connected to this not y, it is also connected to that not y. Similarly, this x here is connected to this not x and to that not x. So, if I look at this x here, it is connected here and it is connected there, right. So, there is an edge within each clause between the variables in the clause and there is our edges across clauses connecting every literal to its negation in any other clause. So, now if I have an independent set, right, it can only choose one of these, right, because if I pick 
the top vertex in the triangle, I cannot pick either of the bottom two because there will be an edge and similarly. So I can pick none, but I can pick at most one, right? So if I have, if I am able to pick one per clause, right? Then if I have four clauses, then I will actually have four, four elements in my independent set, right? Now once I pick this, then because of the edges, I cannot pick this and I cannot pick this, right? So it constrains across clauses how I can pick literals. So I have these constraints which tell me that if I pick y, so I can think of picking y as the same as setting y to be true. So it says that if I set y to be true, then in this clause y is not true anymore and in this clause y is not true anymore, so I must pick something else, right? So if I pick this y here, then perhaps I must pick this x here. Right? And if I pick this x here, now I am stuck because I have a not x there and I have a not y there and both of them are not pickable, so I am stuck. Right? So actually I should probably pick this not x, in which case I cannot pick this. So then I must pick this z right? and then I see that I am okay because if I pick this z, I do not pick this right? and so on. Right? So I have actually got something hopefully which works. So I have picked this y, so I am done. So the question is whether I can find an independent set which picks one node at least in every, it can, cannot pick more than one, can pick exactly one node in every clause, then it means that I can set every one of these to be true, right? So 3SAT reduces to independent set. So, so we have these various reductions, right? So SAT reduces to 3SAT, 3SAT reduces to independent set. We saw last time that independent set and vertex cover are interreducible. And notice that by combining these things, I can actually do a dual reduction, right? I can first convert my SAT problem to 3SAT, take that 3SAT and convert it to independent set. So if I can solve independent set, I can also solve SAT. Or if I can solve vertex cover, I can also solve SAT. So this reduction by this combination of efficient transformations is efficient. So this reduction is transitive. So I can go from set to vertex cover, SAT to vertex cover, right? And it turns out that many of these other problems we have looked at in passing. So traveling salesman we mentioned last time, finding a short tour. Uh, when we looked at linear programming, we said that if we constrain the solutions to have integer solutions, it becomes intractable. So that is also something which falls into this category. And all of these problems, it turns out, are if you take their checking versions, become equally hard, right? So there is a theorem due to Cook and Levin which says that every problem in NP can be reduced to SAT. So SAT was that first problem we started with, which was that Boolean satisfiability. So every problem in NP, you can actually transform it into SAT. So if you can solve SAT, you can solve all of them, right? Or all of them are hard because SAT is hard. That's the other way of thinking about it, okay? So if you can solve SAT, you can do everything. So we do not have to worry about how it is proved, but it is to do with the, with the way we characterize the original version of NP we said in terms of non-deterministic Turing machines. So this theorem, right, translates into a definition. It says that SAT is complete for NP, right? So what does complete for NP mean? It means that first of all, it is an NP, which we know it is because it has a checking algorithm and every problem in NP reduces to it. So it is in some sense representative of all the problems in NP. If you can solve it, you can solve everything. And because of this interreducibility, 3SAT is also NP complete because now everything reduces to SAT and through SAT, everything reduces to 3SAT because I can go from SAT to 3SAT. So by transitivity, everything reduces to 3SAT. 3SAT is clearly in NP because I can check it, right? So 3SAT is also NP complete. So in general, I take, if I want to show that B is NP complete, Right? I take an A which is NP complete and I see if I can find a reduction from A to B because I know that everything reduces to A by the fact that A is NP complete. So I must show that B is in NP right? and everything, uh, there is some other NP complete problem that reduces to this. So that is how for example 3SAT became NP complete. It is NP because I have a checking algorithm for 3SAT similar to SAT. I just have to validate that the um, assignment of true-false is correct and SAT is the known NP complete problem through the Cook Levin theorem. So that is the only starting point. We need one. And after you do one, you can use reductions to get the rest. So this is the status 
of what we know, right? So there are these intractable problems and a large number of these intractable problems are interreducible and have efficient checking algorithms. So these are all these NP problems which are actually in this class called NP complete. So they are in NP and every other problem in NP is as hard as them, they are all interreducible. So again we go back to our question, is P the same as NP or not? Well, there is a good reason to believe it is not because this class of NP complete problems contains many practical problems which you encounter in daily life. So if you find an optimal way of scheduling given some constraints or if you want to find bin packing. So bin packing is a problem of furniture moving, right? So if you are trying to rent a truck to move your sofa and this thing and you have constraints on how they can be put in, what is the optimum number of, of truck loads that you need to get your furniture across? So finding that is again in general exponential and it is reduces to all these problems. We already saw this optimal tour, the traveling salesman problem. Now all of these have immense commercial importance. So people have been trying to optimize these much before we had actual computers and programs, right? So these are problems which if one is in P, all of them are and many smart people have been looking at these problems for centuries, right? So these have been problems of interest to mathematicians and to businessmen and to various things for hundreds of years. And if we have not found an efficient algorithm yet, there is reason to believe that there is not one. And if there is not one for any of these, then all of them are in the same boat, right? So therefore, we have kind of empirical evidence that NP is different from P, but we have yet not been able to prove this, right? And this is actually a prize, it's one of the problems which is celebrated and open in mathematics. The question is whether P is not equal to NP or not. And it's currently carries a $1 million prize, right? So this is one of the big unsolved problems, probably the big unsolved problem in computing. Many people are working on it. It has been, the Cook-Levin theorem is approximately 50 years old, 1971, sorry, 40 years old. So for the last 40 years, even after formulating the problem and understanding NP completeness, we are no closer in some sense to understanding whether this is true or not. We strongly believe it is true, P is not equal to NP, but we cannot prove it. 